and speak on. So um, if you'll just uh, bear with us for just a moment, I just wanted to welcome all of you who are tuning in with me this morning. Sorry that the, uh, the, the stream is running a little bit behind. It was just a technical issue with the machine. But thank you guys. Thank you for working on that. I just wanted to welcome our fathers together in this building today. And to welcome you for joining in with us to all our fathers who are out there who are unable to make it today, but you are together with us online. This is a unique and different time to celebrate Father's Day together. But I just wanted to, uh, as a church together, to honor our fathers, whether you're here present in this room right now or you are tuning in with us online. So welcome. So this morning I'd like to call our fathers together. We already, no. Uh, at this time I'd like to call our, our fathers together and, uh, and have them come forward. And a lot of times people are confused and they don't quite understand um, Father's Day. It's kind of a conundrum to them because you might say, well, I never had a birth child, but I had stepchildren. And I raised them and I was a father to them. And that more than, or not more than anything, but that especially counts because you have been a father figure to somebody. And those who have uncles and aunties and who, who raise their children like mothers and fathers, you need to realize that you are a parent. Although you did not get that technical uh, title on the birth certificate. So if that describes you this morning, please come forward, and we wanted to honor you together. So all of our fathers, if you could stand up and just line up along here. Just, we may maintain our social distancing, but I just wanted to welcome them this morning. So come on forward, and we wanted, wanted to have a special prayer and to give you a gift. Uh, if your child has come with you this morning, uh, Lucy's going to give you give them a gift to present to you. And then for those who have who have not don't have children here this morning, we wanted to give you a special gift for all that you've done. So Keone, here, come on, come on right here, and I just wanted to give you this so you can give this to your dad and, and say Happy Father's Day. Okay? Give this to your dad and say Happy Father's Day. He's right here. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you guys and welcome and. This is from our church. We wanted to have a picture together and to honor our fathers this morning. Brother Adrian right here, you can help them out. All right. I, I think we can get a little bit closer. Let's, let's uh, we might we break it a little rules. Let's, let's squeeze it just a little bit closer and uh, have a picture together. Uncle Warner, get closer. <laughs> Brother Adrian, I can't get all, yeah. Oh my goodness, it's really... One... Two, three. Now, I want you guys to say, you're the best. One, two, three. You're the best. Oh, you guys, it's easy. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, you guys said you could stay just one moment. I just wanted to, to pray over you guys and, and ask a special blessing from the Lord over our fathers this morning. So if you're there watching us online, just grab your father and just... Uh, just hold on to him, show him appreciation, but also uh, it's important that as fathers pray over their children, children need to return that to their fathers, especially as they get older and in their age and their, their medical needs and their emotional needs, we need to be a support to our fathers this morning. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless them. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for these mighty men who have shown us the way, who have gone before for us and been trailblazers in our life to, to, to show us the way to go. Lord, to in, the, the ones that have instructed us and to be there for us, Lord, let me thank you for them this morning. God, I pray that you would bless each and every one of them for Uncle Vernon and for Gary, Lord. Pray blessings over them for Jorge, Lord, and Jesse. God, I pray that you would just touch him this morning. God, bless him. Lift him up, Lord. And for Brother Glenn, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to let him be a shining light to his children and those who are around him. 
Lord, for Uncle Pua, Lord, I pray blessings over his life, Lord, to all his children that may not be on this island with him. Lord, I pray that you would just lift him up, Lord, and just give him strength and encouragement. God, for Billy, God, I pray that you would just touch him as he's the, the youngest father in here. Lord, God, I pray that you would just bless him as he's still raising his son, Keone. Lord, I pray that he would continue to be a great and shining light to him, Lord, and to raise him up in the way he should go. God, I pray for Brother Adrian as he has two wonderful sons that we that have just been so supportive and so loving, Lord. We thank you that he's been a great light to them and raised them up in the way they should go. God, we praise you for all these great men. And I pray that you would just continue to bless them today and in the years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We love our fathers here. Amen. When I was looking at our fathers up here at the front, you know, I see great men of God. And, uh, and there's times when my father may be distant, and uh, not distant emotionally, but distant physically. It's really hard to get down to the mainland and be there. But, but I, as I've shared with a few of you, is that you have the element of a father to me and to Lucy, uh, whether it's uh, through like being our uncle or to be there for us. But you have blessed us beyond what we could even imagine. And I wanted to say thank you so much for that. This morning, today, I wanted to talk a little bit on the idea of a model father. And so fathers in here, by a show of hands, how many feel like you are a model father? Like, if there was a dad out there, he could be just like me and he'd be super successful, right? Hands aren't going up if you guys can't see it on the... There's no hands going up. Why is that? Because fathers a lot of times are selfless and they don't understand or they don't fully grasp or want to brag on the fact of what they have done or endured or taught their children in their lives. There may be some of you here that Father's Day is a very touchy subject. You might have said, maybe my father had passed when I was very young, like, like a brother Vernon, his father passed away, as he shared earlier, at a very early age. And he missed out on a lot of great opportunities with his father. Some of you have said, well, my father was, is, was alive, is alive, but he never was in my life. And some people might say, well, my dad was in my life, but I wish he wasn't. Because maybe he had a difficult childhood. But that's why we need to look to our Heavenly Father and His example of, of what it means to be a father. So when I talk about being a model father, I'm not asking our fathers to be perfect fathers. But instead, we should be a model father in the way that we model Christ. And so this morning, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about some two very great men in my life. And so the first one, of course, is my dad, Jim Palmer. You guys probably met him I, I've a few times as he's come into Hawaii, and I can honestly say, this guy, if he was not my father, he would be my twin, <laughs> because we're so much alike, and I can honestly say he is my best friend, my best guy friend in the world, because of course, I gotta say, Lucy, you're, you're my best friend in the world, and my wife, but my best friend in the world, my dad has always been, from the time I was a very small boy to now, I would say even more now than ever before. Uh, he and I have the same humor and the same interests and even the same funny walk. If you ever see us walking next to each other, we kind of sway our arms back and forth as we walk. And you can tell by standing next to my dad or talking to him or seeing us side by side, you can definitely tell that he is my dad. In fact, when people say, uh, I'm about to crack a joke on somebody, and, uh, and my family can call it out. They say, I see that same little like, spark in your eyes that your dad has when he's about to do something. <laughs> so I can never get away with, uh, with teasing someone in my family. They already call me out on my jokes. But it's because we are so close together, and he's always been there for me. One thing I can always tell on my dad is he is always there for me. When I'm feeling down, he listens and he comforts. Even, even as recently as this last week, I just called my dad up because I, no matter how old you get, if you're feeling down, 
and you've got a dad that listens, that really touches my heart. And it made me realize that there is somebody out there that cares about me and listens for my needs. And he really models the idea of being a dad. And when I have a new great idea, he acts like he likes it. And so, so you know, sometimes my ideas might be off the wall and it, he, they might be kind of like not quite formed all the way. But my dad will say, he'll just be like, like it for at least 10 minutes. And then if, if he thinks that it's a good idea, he'll continue. If not, he will give constructive criticism. But when I look at this picture and I, I just was going through my pictures and I found this, I just love the expression on his face because he's talking to his children at this moment. If you look at him, he just has that, that sparkle in his eyes, that kind of sparkle that when he talks to anybody else besides his children, uh, it's just not there. But this is a specific way he looks at his children with love and admiration and praise, and, uh, and, and he believes in his children. I feel this really captures the delight and interest he takes in my life. But this next slide up, it's kind of a throwback to my old school days when he would walk me to school. And so, in fact, here he is. He's walking me to school on the first day of my 15th year in school. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. I, when, we, when he came and visited me, he just happened, the last part of his visit ended up being when I was going back to college just a few years ago and I couldn't pass up on this opportunity, I said, I am so glad I have my dad here to walk me to school. <laughs> I got a lot of funny looks from all the other college students in the parking lot that day. <laughs> I love my dad. But the God, God, he says, you know, I am your heavenly father. He gives these, us these father figures in our lives to guide us, to show us the way. And sometimes uh, the father figures that we have show us what not to do. And, uh, and for that, that's tragic, but it also teaches us how to be better fathers. The next person I wanted to talk about is my father-in-law, and that's Doug White. You guys all know him. Um, this guy, you already know him, Pastor White. He, he retired here as pastor from this church just a couple years ago, but he is my father-in-law, and I love him to death. In fact, there's always this joke about in-laws being difficult or mean or condescending, but I can honestly feel that between him and my wife, when I met my wife and I met him, I believe he was the first one to fall in love because he was my cheerleader from very early on, even when there's, there's this silly guy, some uh, military guy about to deploy to Iraq, wants to marry his daughter in five weeks, and he, and I asked him that day, I was like, I was like, you know what, I was thinking about, um, I would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, and he, and he said, well, you're coming up to Iraq, um, are you thinking about halfway in between your tour, or are you thinking about after the tour, and I said, how about next Friday? <laughs> That's love right there because he says, you know what, that's quick. He says, but that's doable. <laughs> but I love him because he was my cheerleader from very early on. But not only did he cheer me along in my early relationship with my wife and, and, and to mentor and to guide me uh, while I lived in Hawaii, he also became my spiritual father, my mentor and my guide as he brought me into ministry. In fact, he was on the education team that, uh, that, that, brought, uh, that got me to get my ordination and my license for ministry. And he was my lead pastor, and I became his associate pastor. So Doug is not only my father-in-law, but he was my spiritual mentor as I entered ministry. And we would work together, and he would teach me two of the most important things as a pastor, what I need to know, how to learn and apply God's word, and how to fix things. So we see this next slide. <laughs> now, I'm, let me tell you about this. If you guys have ever done a construction project with him, you would know that he is very meticulous in everything he does. And, and he just, he does it with absolute quality. <laughs> yeah. He does it with absolute quality. Everything he does, you look around this church, you can see his signature of the quality of workmanship that he does. And, uh, and after, even after, 
Pastor White had moved to the mainland and he retired, uh, we took on the project to paint this sanctuary with Brother Ben and, and Les Kidwell. We worked together uh, like 18 hours a day until it was done. But the funny thing is, my father-in-law, he'd always give me instructions. Here he would say, now be careful, because I used to be a painter, he would tell me. Now you have to have a steady hand as you follow down. And you don't really need to put paint on, or you don't have to put tape on the wall. If you have a steady hand, he'd say, take care of your brushes, do this, do that. And we were, at, uh, I think we were at like hour 16, and I was, it was almost midnight, and we had another couple hours to go. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to cover my brushes and I'm just going to slop on some paint on the wall and, and just be done with this. But you know what happens? I hear his voice. I hear his voice. He says, now, Evan, now that, you know, like if you do that, you're going you're gonna to ruin your brushes and, and you just bought a purdy brush and you don't want to do that to a purdy brush. And if you rush, you're going to have to come back and do this later. And I just I said out loud, I said, Dad, get out of my head. <laughs> Because I could hear his voice of instruction constantly. But that's my father in law. That's my dad. That when I hear a voice in my head, it's not one of condemnation. It's not one of uh, condescension. But it's a voice of encouragement. It's a voice of wisdom. It's a voice of instruction. And when I think about a model dad and, and what it means to model Christ, I have two father figures in my life, and they model Christ in different ways. But all of that adds to who I am as a man today. Amen. So that one day when I have a child myself, and I really trust the Lord, we're going to have a child. But when I have a child one day, I can say, God, thank you. Thank you for this great example of what it means to have a godly father in my life. But this is... This next picture I wanted to share you with, with you is we didn't always agree in what we did, but sometimes we would disagree, but that didn't mean that we were not of the same heart. But my favorite part about everything was our business meetings that we'd have uh, at, at Denny's in the morning. So we, that last <laughs> <laughs> we would sneak out and we'd have our business meeting when the, when the ladies went to work. But, um, but I just love that quality time with him. But this morning, going back to this idea that we have model fathers. We have a model of being a father. That, once again, is our heavenly father. God, he has been, he has been there for us. He has never forsaken us. He has never left us. And, and that song that says, I am who he says I am. Why is that? Why, why does that ring so true for a child of the Lord? It's because when you're a child, your father's voice is the only thing there. Your father and your mother, that's, like, we can expand this to a both parents, but your parents' voice is what establishes your self-worth and your value in life. So if you grew up with a father that was tearing you down and telling you how terrible you are, that's the voice you're going to hear when you're going through a difficult time. But when you have a, a father that, that encourages you and, and is that, that father that really cares and is, and is invested in you, you hear his voice and it encourages and directs. But I remember when I was little, I always wanted to have something special for my dad. I guess I didn't have to be forced to do it. I always had an appreciation for my dad. So when Father's Day would come up, I would ask my mom for some money so I could buy my dad a gift. <laughs> but I always, she'd give me a few dollars and, and, and I would try my very hardest to find a perfect Father's Day gift. But, uh, but inevitably, I would find an ugly tie. And, and how many of you guys gave your father some terrible gifts, right? <laughs> Uh, she's like, no, I just don't give my dad gifts. So. No, I just kidding. <laughs> Lucy is so sweet. She, uh, but she's very thoughtful. But for me as a kid, I just, I just didn't have that compass of thoughtful, good gifts. So I'd always end up getting them a, a funny tie, some terrible gifts, I'm sure. But without fail, somewhere along the line, maybe several times in, in our time growing up, we'd get him that mug that you've all seen. In big bold letters, it says "World's Greatest Dad" on it. Right? Have you seen that one? And uh, 
That's that's the greatest gift. That would be that would be the perfect gift to give your dad if it was the only one in existence, right? If, if there was no other mugs or anything else that that indicated that you have the world's greatest dad, and you're like, I found the mug and I'm gonna give it to the dad that is the greatest. He's my dad, you know. But but the thing is, those mug makers, they're 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 kind of playing on the fact that kids are naive and they're counting on the fact that the kids aren't going to look behind the mug they pulled off the shelf and see that there's 30 other ones just at that drugstore alone, right? <laughs> How can there be a million world's greatest dad? Maybe it's like the, uh, the Oscars. That would make more sense if we gave the world's greatest dad award every year. And you could say, you know, like, this year's world's greatest dad award goes to Steve Blankenship from Sandusky, Ohio. Steve endured a 15-hour road trip with five children without once threatening to stop this car and whoop every last one of you. <laughs> Let me tell you, this man is a saint. Or you can say, <laughs> like after the break, we'll be presenting My Dad is Stronger Than Your Dad Award. But even so, that would indicate that, that there's one gift, one time a year, like the Oscars, and that would leave a lot of other dads out feeling like they're not the greatest dad in the world. But this, the truth is, there's truth in those mugs, not because of the mass production appeal of them, but because they are absolutely 100% true when it is passed from the hand of a child to his dad. You know, we've talked about that uh, with, with somebody even this morning, is a child loves his dad, even if his dad is not perfect, right? Even his, when he's separated from his dad, he doesn't see as much bad as other people go in and starts putting rose-colored glasses. You know, even people who've had a terrible father, you give them 30 years and they're praising their father on Facebook saying, I wish I could be with you, Dad, because I loved you and you were the greatest dad, right? Why is that? Because children naturally look up to their dad as a mentor. They look at him as a guide. And that progression, uh, when you start out, when you're really young, you're going to be, uh, you're going you're gonna to definitely believe that your dad is the strongest, the smartest, and, uh, and, and the greatest dad in the world. In fact, I used to look at my dad and say, you know, why is my dad not writing books? And why isn't my dad an astronaut? And why, you know, he's 35 years old. He's old enough to be president. Well, get him elected already, right? Because my dad was the greatest dad that I've ever seen. And the progression in everybody's life kind of goes like this. At four years old, you're going to say, my daddy can do anything. You get in an argument with another kid on the playground and you're like, if my dad was here, he could beat up your dad. And it was kind of like this gladiator match where you bring your champion, they bring their champion, and, and somehow they're supposed to fight and, and prove who's the strongest. But at seven years, you're like, you know what? My dad knows a lot. He knows a whole lot. I think he might know everything. In the days before Google, my dad was Google for me. You know, like, I, he's like, he could tell me whatever he wanted to say, and that would be my reality. He'd be like, why is the sky blue? And you're like, oh, because there's food coloring in the sky. And I would totally believe it. Because my dad, at that point in my life, knew everything. But eight, uh, as he progresses to eight, nine years old, he would be like, hmm, my dad doesn't quite know everything. At 12 years, you're like, well, naturally, he doesn't know everything. When you're like 14 or 15, he's like, oh, I can't believe how old-fashioned and out-of-date my dad is. At 21 years old, I think that's the pinnacle of rejecting your father's wisdom because you'll say, that man is out-of-date. What do you even expect from him? Because at 21 years old, you're, not, you're old enough to realize that your dad may not know everything, but you're too young to realize that you don't know everything either. Yeah. Yeah. There comes a point in life when the child begins to realize, and it hits that, that peak point of distrust in their dad, and it starts, uh, the trust starts returning again. And you start saying, maybe dad wasn't so out of touch as I thought. When you're 25 years old, you're like, you know, my dad may not know everything, he knows a little bit about it, but still, I, mean, I, I need to check other sources. But at 30 years, you're like, I must find out what my dad thinks about it. You know, if Lucy can tell you, every time I uh, 
I have an idea, like I, I shared, is, is I just got to call my dad up. If I have a stupid dad joke in my mind, I'm like, I'm not even a dad, but I'm ready for, I'm ready for these dad jokes. I'll call him up and share it with him. I want to know my dad's opinion. And at, at 35 years, I can't wait to, to tell my dad my thoughts and my ideas and my dreams. At 50 years, you start, you may have lost your dad. You ask that question, what would dad have thought about that? At 60 years, you say, my dad literally knew everything. At 65 years, you say, I wish for just one moment I could speak to my dad one more time. I wonder what he thinks about that. When I was uh, thinking about that, my mom says that all the time. She says, in the time that my dad was alive, I never fully understood what it meant to not have him. And if you've lost a dad or you've lost a mother that you loved and you respected, you don't realize how important they are until after they're gone. But the truth is, that's the role that a dad has in your life. And he gives you this understanding of what it means to be a role model. But in this church this morning, I wanted to talk about the prodigal son this morning. And I've talked about the prodigal son and the idea that the prodigal son is a great story of how we're never too far from the Lord to where he won't accept us back. It's a story of forgiveness and restoration. It's also a story, a cautionary tale of being self-righteous like the brother in this story and saying, you know, why are you welcoming your brother back when I've been in that and my brother back when I've been in this house the whole time? And so I preach about that being a cautionary tale. But this morning, I want to look at it in a different idea. Is that the prodigal son is a, the story of that is a model. It shows in that the, the character which is, which is to represent God himself. But it's also a model to us as believers, as potential fathers and father figures. Parents in general, I, I, I don't want to leave the moms out this morning, but as we look at this, is a great model of how to be a parent. So the first idea is that a model father, what we learn from this story is that a model father teaches the truth from infancy on up. Jesus was not telling this story in a vacuum. He was actually speaking not to people who, who had never heard of the gospel before. They never heard of the word of God. He wasn't speaking to Romans or he wasn't speaking to Babylonians. He, Jesus in this story was speaking to people who had grown up knowing the word. It was a, a basic to this generation to have a great heritage and, and to be raised up in the word. Even Deuteronomy, this is uh, before entering the promised land, Moses reminded the people of Israel this before they went in. It was a very important thing to remind them. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. These words, and this is where it's important to teach your children, it says, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hands and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this is what was important to the society at the time is that spiritual discipline is essential to this teaching. To, to Jesus was building off of a already established understanding that children needed to be raised up in the way of the Lord. Deuteronomy 8.5, Moses incorporates this uh, also in the wilderness. It says, thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. So he's saying God is this role of our Heavenly Father, and a father naturally needs to, to discipline his son, not in just the whipping him and, and making sure he gets in line, which sometimes they might need a little bit of urging in that matter, but the building up, not just disciplining, but spiritual disciplines in their life, where they learn how to follow the Lord, and they, they know his word, and they hear his word. He warns that not only fathers, but mothers also need to live themselves under the authority of God. They need to pass that unto their children. 
If we teach them just one mode of conduct and live under a different code, that undoes everything we try to tell them, right? Maybe that's why kids sometimes get to a point when they get a little bit older and they see their dad um, saying one thing and doing another. It's no longer my dad knows everything. It's like my dad knows everything, but he doesn't do the right thing. And that's where the hypocrisy accusations come. You might say, well, if somebody accuses you of hypocrisy, your own child you might say, I deserve that. I deserve that. Because I should have been not just teaching you, but showing you the wisdom of God and living the life before you. But let's make it right. And so you see the model father. He teaches children from infancy and he displays it. But the second one is the model father has respect for the individual's autonomy. A father has respect for uh, the idea that their children are individuals and they make their own decisions. Wouldn't it be great if you could just make all your children's decisions for them? I know that's probably a time I would have been married a long time before I actually got... Well, I'm sorry, but my mom was always trying to play matchmaker. I'm telling you what, she's just like, that girl's nice. And she's watching, so I'm, I, mean, I forget that we're recording this. But anyway, so my mom would, would have me uh, down a different path. My dad might have had me down a different path. But the autonomy that I possess is also comes from the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I was raised the right way, and then the Holy Spirit took care of areas where my dad did not have the foresight to go. So we begin the story of the, the prodigal son in Luke 15, verse 11. And, and it says, he said, and he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of your estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. As we know this story, we've preached it a million times, but the idea of the prodigal son, wouldn't you say, you know, like, what would be your reaction if your kid was like, you know what, dad, I waited long enough, I want my inheritance, and I want it now. Lucy's tried that before, it didn't work, you know. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> but sometimes kids want to rush the process. They see their parents with all their house full of furniture, and they see what their parents have taken years to build up, and they say, I want that, and I want it today. So what would your reaction be if your kid did that? You know, would you give him uh, the finances that could, that could give him what he needs for his rebellion? Wouldn't that be a tough one, right? It wasn't unusual for the Jewish people at the time to distribute their estates to their children. Uh, as they were retiring, they would want to start peeling off some of their wealth and, and responsibility to their children. And under the law, it gave a clear definition of financial responsibility. The older son must get two-thirds of the share of the estate, and the next son can get just one-third of that estate. But there's a certain demanding attitude in this, is there not, of this younger son. He's like, I know what's coming to me. I've, I've helped you with your books. I know what you have, and so I want that, and I want it now. It's like that uh, J.G. Wentworth, right? He says, it's my money and I want it now. The kid's kind of shouting to his dad and he's saying, life is too short to me for me to have to wait for you to die or retire. So give it to me. Uh, I'm bored. I want an exciting life. And I want out. Now the father could have said no, right? God, and, and God, our Heavenly Father, he can easily tell us, no, you can't do that. Like he's, he, He'll tell us, you know, you might be straying away and God has every ability and every right to, to knock us back on the right path. But sometimes God allows us to go. You know, this father could have blackmailed him or played an emotional game with him and, or tried to play that game of comparison saying, how come you can't be like the other son? How come you just can't understand that it's coming to you and it'll, and it'll be even better if you just wait? Or they could also play that emotional game that a lot of parents will play with. You're breaking my heart, you know? <laughs> Don't you know you're hurting me down deep inside? No, this father was prepared to stand by the teachings and the humble modelings that he and his wife were stewards of his children and not owners of his children. That's the key difference is a lot of parents feel like, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. And while that sounds funny and tough and cute or whatever, it's untrue. Because God has placed children into your hands to be stewards of them, stewards of their body, 
knowing that kids will destroy themselves if left to their own devices. You're steward of their finances. You're steward of their emotions. You're steward of their mind and understanding until they can be of such an age that they can make decisions on their own. But he was willing to evaluate, and God does the same thing. He's willing to evaluate us according to our own individual understandings. He knew that this person wanted this, his son wanted to be his own person. But God in his creative design did not create our children to be robots, autonom automatons, who function as mechanical men or women, but that each person is created with the ability to choose. And if you judge somebody according to what their children does, you know, if they go down the wrong path or whatever else, you might say, oh, well, that person's kid, I can't believe he raised them like that, and then that kid went downhill, but how did you know perfect, like what would you would imagine to be perfect parents with terrible children, right? But if you are passing judgment on a, on a father who has a wayward son, then you're passing judgment on God himself. Because he created people with the ability to choose. And his children have, by and large, chosen to turn against him. But that's the choice he gives. But a modern, modern father won't stand in the way of consequences. We read in verse 13, it says, And not many days later, the younger son gathered up everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. There he squandered his estate with loose living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled the stomach with the pods that the swines were eating, but no one was giving anything to him. Apparently, this father had money. He had servants. He could have played that game and, and assigned a servant to his son uh, to make sure his, his son didn't fail so bad and crash so terribly that he would never experience the consequences. Now, I, I, one of my friends, he was talking about his relatives uh, that, that had the, the daughter got into herself set up with this uh, health shake, multi-level marketing scam, and, and it was kind of like that, those one things where you had to buy in and you had to get a bunch of product and then you had to turn that product, then you had to turn your buyers into sellers and, and it, it just got bigger and bigger and the, the, the cost was so great and she wasn't doing very well and she expressed frustration to her parents. She says, you know what, these shakes aren't doing weird really well. I wish my own family would have some more interest in me trying to be an independent person. And so the parents, what they did is they started buying up all her milkshakes. And you know what that did? Instead of having her face the consequences early for bad decisions, she, she posted on the internet and said, look at me, I'm independent, I'm making money. And all the while her parents' living room started stacking higher and higher with milkshakes, terrible milkshakes that they'll never drink. The parents eventually had to face the reality that they could not afford financing her mistakes. And so they had to eventually cut her off anyway. But see, that's what this father did that was admirable. And that's what God does. Is he allows us to experience it, the consequences of our sins, uh, the consequences of our mistakes, not enough to destroy us, but enough for us to hit that rock bottom like this son was looking at the swine. And he's like, I could have a much better life even being a servant in my father's house. He, and he wanted those pods that the, that the pigs were eating because he was so down in the dumps. But his father resisted that urge to go and pull him out of the mud, to pull him out of the muck and the mire. Because if he did that, he would know the son would never fully turn back and be repentant. Instead, his son would just be stood up just long enough to where he could go out and, and do it all over again. Because he never experienced enough of that to give it up. So the model father won't stand in the way of consequences. He, God is not in the process or the business of premature rescue. As much as his heart is breaking and he doesn't want his kids to have tears, he lets them go. Are you that kind of father? Are you that kind of mother that's willing to let your kids fall straight on their backs in order that they can come back to the Lord? 
or are you enabling them with bad behavior? Are you willing to faithfully and teach them and model this and let them have their autonomy but be willing to come to them when they turn around? Sometimes you just have to say, well, it, it's your life. I've done the best I can. I haven't done the best at all times. You know my weaknesses. You know my problems. Forgive me for that. You know what I believe, but I'm letting, I'm cutting these strings of control off of your life. I'm going to let you do what you choose to do. But remember this, I'm always your dad. I'm always your mom. And I will always love you no matter what decision you make. That's the key right there. That you leave that the back door open for your child to return. Not to cut them off, not to say you're done with them and you never want to see them again. But to say, I am still your dad. I'm still your mom. And I'll be there for you. With a big hug and a few tears, you have to be prepared to send them off to seek their own life. To face whatever consequences, positive or negative, or anything in between. That's actually a biblical concept for the reason of being married to somebody else, you leave your mom, you leave your dad, and you cleave to your husband and you cleave to your wife because they have to grow up sometime. But the model father has a love for us that refuses to give up. Most of us have a breaking point, right? If you Have you ever had that where you're, you're just like, I am done with this, I am upset, and I can't handle it anymore? We could put up with only so much nonsense and we're patient to a point. But at the same time, God has a pity on a son and a, and a daughter who has given up on him and have left them. And, uh, but God does not give up. And he's always looking out for his son. He's always looking out for his wayward daughters. And he's looking into the horizon. And we're called to faithfulness. And, the, and we have to be faithful to this idea that, our, that God will inspire our children. If we've raised them up in the way they should go, if there is a voice of reason inside of them, God will speak to them. If they have not rejected the Lord all the way, if they've been raised up in the way they should go, that voice is still in there, right? How many of you have done that when you were in your rebellious stage with your parents or with, uh, against your grandma who raised you, your grandpa that raised you, and you just hear their voice of disappointment, of sorrow, of sadness? When you start doing the wrong thing. But you have parents that never give up on you. They love you when you're unlovable. This way we see this father who's very faithful in carrying out his ongoing responsibilities. He's not chasing down his son. He's, do, he's daily aware of his, um, his breaking heart. This father's hurt never goes away. I'm sure if you have a child that has gone wayward, right? Your heart will never stop breaking for them. But there comes a point. It's almost like losing somebody, right? When your child falls away from the Lord, your heart starts breaking. And it never stops breaking. There comes a point when you just have to move forward in your life and realize that you have other responsibilities to do. And you have to give that child up in prayer to the Lord. Don't give them up. But give them to the Lord in prayer. Say, God, they, they were, I was a steward of this child for a certain point, and now I'm passing them back into your hands. So when you pray for your child, don't give up on them. Don't shut the door in their face, but realize that you can't always just rescue them every time they have a tear and every time they break, bump their knee or hurt themselves. It's important to know and for us to live with this broken heart. Sometimes it's some of the best things that we can teach ourselves. Kind of like this, this point of, of absolute peace that the Lord gives us. He's, he promises us to have the peace that passes all understanding. And so we need to pray that the Lord's peace would take control of our situations. John 16.33 says, These things that I have spoken so that... In me, you may have peace. In the world, you may have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And what I love about the, the reality of the, these biblical teach, teachings is that we are alerted and we are re ready and we see these realities of life. But none of us are free from troubles. But I'm talking about that God says, you know what, you will have troubles in this life. And you, you may never be free of them, but it's okay 
to communicate love and vulnerability. It's okay to say where you feel like you have failed or where you have not been the best father or you know that you are not always uh, the very best example to your children. And you may also say, I've done everything that I can, but they decided to go their own way anyway. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Because ultimately, your children have to decide for themselves if they're going to follow the Lord. And so as your heart breaks, you say, God, I've done the very best of my ability and sometimes I fail. But we can trust the Lord that he'll be faithful to minister to their hearts and open that door once again. So the son is sitting here in, in the mud looking at the pigs wanting to eat their food. And in verse 17, it says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? And here I am dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. And while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, could you imagine his son just sitting there like stinky as can be. He still smells like the pigs. He probably hasn't had the time or the ability to stop him and wash himself off. And it says while he was still a ways off, the father didn't even ask him where he's been or what he's been doing or demanding the who, what, when, where, why. But he had a father that refused to give up. And he ran to him. So a model father is forgiving. So what would your reaction be if your child did to you as his prodigal son did to his father? Being a pastor, I would say, uh, like if he came back, I'd be like, okay, my kid's back. Now I'm going to have a series of, of sermons on how to respect your parents and how to be a good son and how to be honor your, your elders and, and be, you know, I just try to want to like have a, an I told you so sermon. As much as I try to avoid that, sometimes that will get out when I'm trying to get a message through. But I, uh, I'd be prepared to, know, to, to preach it to him at a moment's notice, whether it's behind the pulpit or in person. But instead, our love should explode inside of us to have compassion, to run and embrace our children and kiss them. This sudden speech he, he had prayer, carefully prepared. He says, I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. He, have you ever done that when you know you've messed up and you have to go speak to your parents? I remember one time I messed up really bad. I, I had had an accident and I broke something at my mom's and she's already in her room and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm walking like little steps at a time. I'm like just preparing in my, okay, what am I going to tell my mom? She's going to kill me. I, I'm just, might as well call my friends and say goodbye to them because this is it for me. I'm done. But what happened? So I went into the room and I said, Mom, I did this, and I'm sorry, and before I could even get those words out, she saw the tears in my eyes, and she held my head to her chest, and she says, that's just stuff. That's okay, honey. It's just stuff. So that father, as he saw his son leave with everything he had given him, that father didn't see the weight of that inheritance, or the, what it meant, the, the, the rebellion and the hurt in there, he just said, that's just stuff. That's just possessions. But what is important is that my child is on his way home. So the model father is forgiving. He's a celebrative, celebratory person. A model father celebrates. In Luke 15, 21, it says, And the father said to him, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he didn't even respond to that word. He says to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robes and bring them and put them on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he has come back to life again and he has been lost and now he is found. And they began to celebrate. He calls for the best robe. In the Hebrew tradition, a robe stands for honor. He gave him a ring and that 
It signifies authority. If he put the family ring back on his hand, that, that gives the son the ability to sign documents with his signet ring and give and speak on behalf of the father. So he was giving him power of attorney. And so he called for shoes to be on his feet. And shoes stand for a son as opposed to a slave or a servant. The son was clothed in the finest garments and he had shoes. And it also was a symbol of freedom to go where he wanted to go. God was once again restoring him as if he never left. That father forgave him and he celebrated. And he called for a banquet and a feast. Let me ask you this question. Are you a celebratory person? Or when somebody comes to you and they say, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. Do we hold back and be like, oh, no, no, let's hold back on the celebration. Let's hold back on the hugs. I'm going to see if you're for real, right? We're just going to hold back. I've seen this before, this pattern. My other kids did it to me and they're back out again. But God didn't wait for that. That father did not wait for that either. God says, I'm not waiting for you to, uh, to show me that you have a repentant heart. I, I just see your repentant heart right now, and I'm going to celebrate. And no matter what happened in the past and whatever happens in the future, I'm going to trust that you're back with me for good. He restored a trust in him that he had before he left that house. And he says, you are my son, not just a servant, not just a, not a slave, not just a, a, an acquaintance of mine, but you are my family once again. And I'm restoring everything, every right and responsibility of a son is now yours again. But notice that if somebody says, you know what, I forgive you, but I, I, I don't trust you. It's a lot easier to slip into that before. But if someone says, I forgive you. And I trust you're not going to do it again. What does that do to your heart? Whew. That fills me with responsibility once again. As I have been rescued from the mire. I have been allowed back into this person's life. And I'm not going to disappoint them again. The Bible says your kindness, O oh Lord, has led us to repentance. It's not his strict hand or his ability to discipline what he does. But it was his kindness that leads us to repentance. So finally, the father is willing to live with ambiguity and able to live in the unknown. Luke 15, 25 says, Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And then he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring of these things, what they could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out to him and began pleading with him. But he answered and he said, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours, yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he has devoured your wealth with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, and this is where his forgiveness continues. He says, son, you have always been with me. And that what is mine is yours. And we, but we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost, and now is found. Oh, that's powerful right there. We don't know the end of the story. I remember going to work with my dad in the morning. We, I would just love to, to just be with him when we do construction. And we'd listen to, uh, uh, to Paul Harvey in the morning. He's like, I'm Paul Harvey. Good day, you know. And he's, he would tell us a wonderful story. And he, would, he wouldn't tell you who it's about, you know, and, uh, and what the end of the story is. But he would tell you the, the, the first part of the story. And then there would be a long commercial break. And then he'd come back and tell you the rest of the story, right? He, he had that, that way about him. That, and, and I would get so hooked on the story. And then my dad would, uh, would park the car, shut it off, and we'd walk in. And I'd be like, what? I don't know the end of the story. I just Can I just stay in the car for a little bit? And, and I want to know. And that's what we are. We want to see what the end result is going to be, right? We want to see if this son is going to 
betray his father again. We want to see if the other son will accept this. But it ends right there. And in the same way, we need to be accepting of the fact that we don't know the end of the story. God is the one that writes our story. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. But it's okay to not know. The father might have had to live with anger. The other son might have seen it as unfair. And the father would have to deal with that animosity with his older son. But he wasn't interested in being a part of it. His son didn't want to be a part of that celebration. But Jesus has a very interesting way of bringing this story to a conclusion. Is that the father's response on sneering at his, the older brother sneering accusations and, uh, and mad that he was getting a, a party. He said, hey, hey, he assured his son, what is mine is yours. You already live in the inheritance right now and whatever he's wasted, it's already there, it's already gone. But what you have is a living inheritance. You are the head of my household. So that should be enough to realize that there should be forgiveness. I don't have money left for this son, but there is forgiveness for him. He acknowledges his older son's faithfulness as the Lord will do when we stand before him. You ask, why? Why is it that we serve the Lord and we go through some hardship on, the, on behalf of the Lord when we could just at the last moment ask the Lord, forgive me and we could be in heaven? Well, that's true, right? We know that at any moment the Lord will forgive us and, and the sufficiency and the, the superiority of Christ's sacrifice for our sin is enough to cover any sin that we have. But the greatest thing is if we serve the Lord on this earth and we live in his household, we get to bring other people with us. Our children have a fighting chance to follow the Lord. We live in the goodness of God. We live in our support system that we have with one another. How many of you guys have been in a dark and, and a sad point? Maybe you've been hospitalized and the people, the men and women of the Lord came and they visited you and they lifted your spirits. They prayed with you and the Holy Spirit spoke to your hearts. It's much better to live every day under the power of the Holy Spirit than to live one day outside in the tents of the wicked, right? What better is one day in your courts, David says. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house than to dwell in the prosperous tents of the wicked. Because greater is it to be in the house of the Lord with his people. But our final reward and our privilege isn't looking up at our dad and saying, wasn't I good, dad? But our great privilege is when God looks at us and says, well done, Thou good and faithful servant, enter into eternal rest. So as a model father, when you look at this idea of what a father is, it's not saying you have to be perfect, but you can see this example of how to temper your emotions, how to begin to rebuild relationships that are broken. The word tells us and, um, is that we have this responsibility to fight for those who have not had that same experience. To be fathers to the fatherless as Christ, or as God is father to the fatherless. Psalm 68 verse 4 says, Sing praises to the Lord. To his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides on the cloud. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. Father to the fatherless, defender of the widows. This is God who is, whose dwelling is holy. And God places the lonely in families. This is great. He's saying, I'm placing the lonely in families. And he sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. But he makes the rebellious live in sun-scorched lands. And I'm just going to end that scripture there. God has encouraged us and his example shows us that we need to be fathers to the fatherless. That doesn't just mean by gender, but like I'm a man, so I'm going to be a father. This is saying I'm going to be a mother to the motherless, a mother to the fatherless. I'm going to be a father to the fatherless. You know, I am going to be that one that God has called me to be and I'm going to fight for them and I'm going to bring them up 
No matter what stage you are in life, you can still be a father figure or a mother figure to somebody, right? And I think about this, and I, I wanted to give a bigger presentation on this, but we support several orphans, and that's not just the only thing we do as a church. But one thing I thought was interesting is the, the orphans that we support in Thailand, they had one group of children. How many children was it? They have 20 to 22 children in, in both houses together. But they just received some new children where the, the mother had passed away and then the father followed shortly behind that. They are the father to the fatherless. They are the mother to the motherless. And you guys are all a part of that by supporting these ministries. And so I encourage you today as we look at this model parent all together, be that what God has called us to be. And to, work, and to fight for those who are oppressed, those who are needy, and those who are without parents. So if it means like joining a big brother, big sister program, or being a part of somebody's life, taking a greater responsibility to lead, guide, and direct them. If you see that they are lacking in that area of having a good godly father, it's every one of our responsibilities to be a godly parent. So let's all stand today. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have given us this example of being great fathers, Lord. Not just a great father, but a great parent. Uh, whether it's mothers who have dealt with their wayward children or fathers who have dealt with the rebellion of their kids. God, we thank you that you have just given them, given us this inspiration and this model of what it means to be a father to our children. God, I pray that those who are here today and know that they have really had error in their, in their parenting skills, Lord. God, I pray that you would just bring healing and restoration in those relationships. God, I pray that you would help us acknowledge our mistakes, acknowledge our failures, and move past that, Lord, and, and today make that commitment that we will be the parents that we were meant to be. If our parents did not, were not those kind of parents, Lord, let us be that example to others. Lord, let us break that generational curse of having to have years and generations of alcohol abuse and, and problems, Lord. But we break this, this moment, Lord, we pray this over the fathers and the mothers today, Lord, that they would turn their lives around and to follow you in everything that they do. God, I pray that you would just enhance those fathers who have who dedicated their lives to showing their kids the right way. And Lord, I pray that the lessons that they give their children today about the character of the Lord and what they display through their life of striving to be righteous, Lord, I pray that that would land on fertile soil on the children, God. And that even if they fall away, Lord, even if they feel like they know way more than their parents, Lord, God, let them realize that they follow a God that is above all. And that eventually they can come to their senses. No matter what the consequence is, they will come to their senses and return to you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. And for those who are tuning in with us online, we'll see you again next week. And as a group today, uh, here in this church, I wanted to pray for Sister Ruth.